Rima Fadlala here, proud daughter of Dearborn, professional love letter, and avid vibe capitalist. And today we have the pleasure of speaking to Mariam Jalul. Mariam Jalul is an avid traveler, coffee connoisseur, and proud bookworm. Hi, Mariam. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you for having me. Of course, of course. So we're going to jump right into it. And we love Dearborn, clearly. And we know that you love coffee. As we said, you're a coffee connoisseur. So if Dearborn was a type of coffee, it could be a brand, it could be, you know, how you guys get into like the little beans, what would it be? Um, oh my God, that's a good question. If Dearborn was a type of coffee, it would be an iced latte. Okay. Um, I'm trying to think of like some profound reason why, but I think it's, I love iced lattes. I get them wherever I go. I think they're just consistent and I love consistency. So Dearborn, I think for me is that consistency. I know, I know what I'm walking into. I know what I'm going to get every time. Oh, that's hilarious. I love iced <laughs> lattes. So that, that makes sense. Um, so today we have the pleasure of speaking to the first person from our Fortson, as, as far as I can remember, as far as I've heard of, who attended Harvard. And you're the first person, first woman, first hijabi from Fortson who attended Harvard. And that's obviously amazing. Um, you and I were friends in high school. We weren't close, but we were friends. And obviously, like I was even I attending college away from home was super inspired hearing that and super excited. Um, and so we're really excited to kind of get into that journey. I want you to walk us through like every step of it. So yeah. like from like the moment you even entertained Harvard, right. like what planted that seed to like applying, just w don't like skip anything. Right. I want to hear yeah. about all of it. Yeah. So, I mean, to start from the beginning, I think what definitely planted the seed, I remember it was either my freshman or sophomore year. I got a pamphlet in the mail from a Harvard summer school program. And so every summer they put on um, classes and you can attend and all that. And I remember looking at this pamphlet and seeing the students walking through the yard. And I literally remember, I either said it out loud or I said it in my head, but I remember the exact sentence. I was just like, wow, can you imagine getting to go there? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the summer program, I think, was like something like ten or $15,000. And so it was not something that, you know, we could ever afford to do. Um, and I remember just putting the pamphlet away and kind of I remember just kind of my heart singing of like, I just so wish this could be a possibility. And in my world, it just wasn't, you know, it wasn't realistic. I had no idea what it would ever take. So it was kind of this far-fetched dream that kind of just died to the wayside and so my entire four years at Fortson really my ultimate goal was to go to University of Michigan in Ann Arbor you know there's the Brem scholarship that Fortson students get and at that point so many students had done it it was something that I saw myself also being able to do just by virtue of you know seeing the path in front of me so that really was the I guess the more ultimate realistic goal that I've had and it really wasn't until my the summer before my senior year, and this is the summer that um, you apply to colleges, that's when the Common App comes out, that I just remember sitting back the summer and really thinking about what is it I want. And I just remember thinking that with U of M, it was very attainable. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking that it wasn't scary, I guess, was, was my biggest thing. And the thought of Harvard was scary. It was far-fetched. It was almost like, who do you think you are to even mm -hmm. consider it? And I remember talking with my friends and, you know, they were like, you have the number, you have the scores, you're valedictorian. Like, why not? Like, why not just give it a shot? And I think even till this day, it's a mantra I always live by of if you don't apply, if you don't even try, you're already rejecting mm -hmm. yourself. And so at the time I was thinking, you know, at least apply. Um, and so I remember that summer, I just gave it, I gave it so much thought and it was terrifying. I just remember like kind of my heart beating even when I made the official decision to just apply, you know? Yeah. Um, and when I finally made that decision, I actually sent my counselor an email because I wanted to get, get everything going and, um, and really just telling her about my official decision. And it's so funny. I actually, you know, found it. Um, and I have like a short excerpt from it, but this was back in July of, 2011 so almost like you know wow. eight nine years ago but um you're gonna read it yeah okay, yeah good. so this is kind of when what I had sent to her and so you know I, I hope you're doing well I just thought I'd update you on a couple decisions I've made for one I made the final decision to apply to Harvard it has been on my mind for quite some time but over the years it has died down I think mostly I've just been holding myself back I was talking to a friend and we were discussing how back in 2007 when a boy from Dearborn High got in and the recognition the west side of Dearborn and the high school itself received because of that. I feel like if I get accepted, I, it will really take Fortson out of the shadows and uplift the east side of Dearborn. 
It will show that you can graduate from Fortin and still get accepted into a, co into a college like Harvard. It will really raise the standards and the spirits in a lot of people. It sort of feels like the school of Fortson is applying. Uh, and the d I, I almost feel like I'm doing it for Dearborn. And then, you know, I go into it and, you know, I say I've discussed it with my parents and they fully d support my decision. And, you know, then I just got into more boring logistical stuff. But pulling up this email yesterday, I think, brought back so because with so much time having gone by, I don't even really remember that this was my mindset wow. going into it. You know, I, I kind of completely forgot that when I made the decision, it was much larger than just myself. And, you know, so when that time came and this was in July and the common app comes out in August. So I, um, and that's, that was also the month of Ramadan. And so I was retaking the ACTs because at the time they were high enough to get into U of M, but I thought I needed a little bit of a higher score for Harvard. And I was taking two SAT subject exams. I had AP class summer work and I was writing all my college app essays. So I just remember that summer, anytime I look back to it, I think of like the montage from Legally Blonde where like, you know, she's like <laughs> working super hard and nothing stopping her and she's doing all these sacrifices. And so I remember it was Ramadan on, I would be at U of M Dearborn Library at 8 a.m. on the die. I'd wake up at 7. I was there by 8. And I would literally stay there until 8 p.m. right mm -hmm. in time to go have a thought with my family. And so, you know, literally for two hours, I'd have the ACT books open. I'd close those, put them aside. And then the next two hours, I was SAT studying. I'd close those, put them to the side. And then I was studying for my AP bio um, class. And then I'd spend like the last few hours writing out my, my application essays. And this just went on that entire month and really well into the school year. And I just remember it being almost, it was such an obsession. It was something... I wanted Harvard at that point so badly because I think, especially when you start really working towards right. something, your heart just wants it more than anything. And so every night, like right before I'd have a thought when I would be praying, I was praying that, you know, Harvard were, would work out. And, you know, my mom at the time would say, I'm only going to pray that if it's wow. best for you, it works out. I'm not going to pray that it works out just because it's Harvard. Um, but for me, it just, it became really an obsession and it was, you know, expecting the worst, but hoping for the best. And so even though I wanted it so bad, I, it, again, it didn't seem like a, a realistic possibility. Um, I hadn't seen anyone else do it in Forza, and I didn't know what it would take. Um, so it was just scary in and of itself. So once the application was in, and then it was just a matter of, of waiting out those, those few months. Mm -hmm. And the day I got accepted, so it was December 15th, and I remember um, they told us starting at 5 p.m. you'd get the decision. And so it was a Thursday and that entire day at Fortson, I was just a wreck. Wow. Like I couldn't focus. I couldn't do anything right. I remember I was, um, I had like key club after and I kept everyone late that day just because to kill as many hours as I can before I got home. And so that day, you know, 5 p.m. comes along. My entire family's in the living room and I just keep refreshing this email and I'm refreshing and I'm refreshing and like, you know, a half hour goes by, still nothing. 45 minutes go by, still nothing. And wow. I, I was told at the time, it was in my mind of like, well, they probably sent all the acceptances first. And so now they're, you know, <laughs> I'm just waiting out the rejection. Um, and at that point, I think it was over an hour. So I was like, we can't just sit around and wait for it. Like everyone go do your thing. And like, if, when I get the email, I'll let you guys know. And so I went and I was studying for my AP bio exam that I had the next day. And then my phone like lights up and I see that it's from like Harvard financial aid and admissions office. Mm -hmm. And so I just start freaking out, like my heart just drops and I, I run to the living room. My mom was still waiting in there and my older sister kind of runs with me and I'm holding this phone and I just couldn't get myself to open it. Like my heart was racing and I was just so incredibly nervous because I think it's hard to finally get that decision on something you've been praying for for so long. And um, and I'm opening it. I'm like, I can't open it. I can't open it. And finally my mom goes, just open it. Like, yalla, you know, like Halsina. <laughs> and so I, I click the email and what I was told is that if it doesn't start off with the word congratulations with an exclamation point, then it's a rejection. So my eyes were immediately scanning for that. And I remember, you know, that wasn't what I saw. And I remember like, I wasn't reading full sentences. Like my mind was racing and my heart was racing. And even my mom told me, um, looking back that like your face just went completely white and you were like stone faced. So I'm reading the email and I, again, I'm not like reading full sentences and I just start seeing the words like, we're delighted, like to inform you, like acceptance. <laughs> like I just remember seeing like clusters of words and I just look up at my mom and my, my face is just completely still and I'm like, I got in. And then I just, she just starts bawling and I just start crying and we're hugging. And I think that's one day 
it's just stitched into my mm-hmm. memory forever. Like every detail down to what I was wearing and we're all just, my brother runs out of his room and he's like, you got in. And I was like, yeah. And we're just all bawling our eyes out. Um, and you know, I'm calling my friends and one of my friends was at U of M Ann Arbor and I told her and she just starts screaming <laughs> and everyone in her dorm room like runs in. They thought someone died and she's like, my friend just got into Harvard. And um, that day actually, I'm pretty sure it was the first day I'd ever seen like my dad cry. And like, I didn't see him cry directly. He was in the basement. I think he heard, you know, everything going on and he comes upstairs to give me a hug and I saw that his eyes were red. And so it was one of those like classical Arab dad moments where you you can never cry. But like, you know, you're, he's, he was just and I think that day it was I definitely felt that day like nothing I ever do could reach the level of pride, like that elated pride that my parents were feeling. And even the next day at Fortson, my mom came in with like a huge tray of Batlewa from Shatila and was like passing it out to the teachers. Um, oh and so this even that so day, good. you know, I walk into that AP bio class having not studied for that exam because I just, I but couldn't whatever. sleep. Whatever, like, you got to go yeah. harder than that one. I was like, I'm done. <laughs> and like, I just couldn't sleep that night. It was such a high um and I walk into that class late, by the way, you know, at that point, I was like, I don't <laughs> care about anything. And everyone just starts clapping. And it was that feeling of just support and pride was was just unbeatable. And mm-hmm. I think for years after that, I really failed to find a moment that topped that level wow. of like elation, you know. Um, and so, yeah, it was. I love that. that story. Yeah. I like love it. It was so visual. Like, I think. I don't know. I just love that that story is being told when it's being told. I know your family. I love your family. So I can literally picture like I know your house. (laughs) I can picture people sitting where they're like I literally have like the vision. And I think it's so important to like hold on to those details. And like this email is amazing. Like I'm so for for my own selfish interest, like and what we're doing with the space, like literally you saying you're doing it for Dearborn. Like to me, I, I, I don't know. I just got goosebumps. I'm really happy for your sake that like you have that documented. Um, because I just want people to hear that, like, this is, this isn't normal for us, you know, these kinds of spaces aren't normal for us. People occupying spaces that like, like you said, like, who do I think I am to even, like, to even imagine myself on this campus, like, to even imagine myself part of this pamphlet, you know? Right, right. I think that's so powerful. I want to, you know, just for, because there's a a few women, um, who got to Harvard this year, you know, hijabi women, and... I've been hearing, like, randomly, like, you know how people talk in Dearborn out of nowhere. Like, they say things, they may or may not mean it. And I know that you dealt with a lot of this at the time where people will throw in comments like, well, they got in because of the hijab. And, like, I love that you got to detail the work that you were putting in. You probably put in five times as much work as other people who, just by virtue of their education being a stronger education, didn't have to, you know, spend those long hours at U of M Dearborn. Um, can you talk through some of that? Did you experience people kind of singling or reducing your hard work and yeah. just sheer grit to the fact that you're like a hijabi woman or a Muslim woman? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think when when I got accepted, I definitely heard those comments of like, well, she only got in because she's a hijabi and she's meeting this like diversity mm-hmm. quota. And that was something I immediately rejected. Um, and I, I think at the time it's hard because you're young and you you. I think it's it's hard to not take a step back and be like, hmm, like how much truth really is there in that? But it really wasn't until I got and I was walking through Harvard's campus mm. and taking these classes that I think I had the knowledge and the experience to fully reject that. And it was something even in the girls who got accepted this year, I ran into them actually at Kafa House and I made sure to remind them of that. And I think it's so easy for people to say that, but you I didn't send Harvard a picture, a headshot of like my hijab, you know, and it's so easy to kind of reduce your acceptance to just that and completely neglect Mm. the fact that you had a perfect GPA, that you were valedictorian, that you worked your butt off for high exam scores, that your essays, you worked on them for months and months and they went through kind of five different rounds. And um, so, so yeah, absolutely. I think it's, I, I definitely heard that, but I completely reject it because I think similarly to what you said, I felt like I had to work that much harder. And mm. in fact, there really aren't many hijabi Muslims there. And so right. if, um, it's actually much easier to be, you know, a white person applying where over 50% of the class is white. Mm-hmm. And so there really aren't, there isn't that much room, I guess, even if we're talking in terms of quotas for you right. to be getting in because of that. And so, um, I think yeah. I completely will remind everyone that you are just as worthy and deserving and as able to be at Harvard as anyone else. Yeah. And, you know, just 
just to be completely transparent and frank, like, I feel like even with the perfect GPA, even with all of those credentials, right. like, it's even harder for you guys. Not just, like, right. in, I want to I hear about what your experience was, particular, yeah. particularly in those first few months. Right. Um, but I, I also really quickly want to shout out the women who got in this year and just, like, for my own personal, like, gratification. Like, I, I want to say that, like, people should feel... I mean, like, people should second-guess what they're really saying when they say that, because even as a non-hijabi woman, like, I don't know how that feels, but I can imagine that that's harder as a 16, 17, 18-year-old girl when you're still figuring your life out to have to also reconcile and understand that identity, the way that the world looks at you, the way that the world is going to look at you when you go to a predominantly white institution like Harvard. Yeah. Um, Nisreen Shukud, actually, who got into Harvard from Forts in this year, wrote a poem like a beautiful moving poem about her hijab mm. and her relationship with her, her hijab and just like getting when I read it it really got me to think about like just what what extra barriers or challenges yeah. and, and obviously like I can't speak on that experience but I know that like I'm sure it's an honor you know mm -hmm. as well but there are real life barriers and emotional barriers that I think women would have to deal with with that experience as well right um so can you talk about that as it, I guess, informed your journey getting to Harvard and then especially like in those first few months being right. at Harvard. Just yeah. so people like really, really second guess like what they're saying when they when they think that or say that. Right. Yeah. So, you know, my first few months at Harvard were incredibly difficult. And this is something I don't shy away from saying, even for students who are now leaving and going out of state. They were incredibly difficult. I just remember so many nights I would spend crying and it was really this visceral homesickness for Dearborn. And mm -hmm. it's because you know, you grow up your whole life in Dearborn, you barely leave, like it's, it's the only reality you know is Dearborn. And so I would just get this visceral homesickness. And in the first few months, I would be flying back, I think once a month back to, back to Dearborn just mm -hmm. to visit and from how much I missed the community and my family, especially. Um, but I think one of the major adjustments of, of leaving and, you know, I was the youngest in my family, the first to move out. And so it definitely felt really scary to do. Um, but I think looking back, and this was something I definitely had to work through my first year, is for the first time in my life, I was a visibly Muslim woman. And what that means is no. when I'm walking through Dearborn, like I'm not any different than anyone else. You know, like I, I just so happen to belong to like the majority, especially living on the east side. So, you know, you're walking around, you go to a grocery store, no one is even taking a second look at you no one is staring you're just who you are and you're li living your life and you know being a hijabi being a visibly muslim woman it was never a salient part of my identity you know it was just it wasn't even something i'd give a second thought to and so my first year i really had to adjust to this idea that when i walk into a room that's the first thing people are seeing and with that are all these judgments about who i am and what i believe and how conservative i am and it was definitely something i felt um, I just wasn't used to, and it was a really hard adjustment to make. So just like walking through the yard, for example, or the or Harvard square and just seeing people like kind of stare and really realizing of like, Oh, are they staring at me? Because they've never, you know, uh, because I'm a hijabi. Like, um, so I think just adjusting to that identity was, was huge for me and it was difficult. Um, but I think, I mean, given that, I, I just had to learn to navigate the world mm -hmm. as a visibly Muslim woman in a way I never had to do in Dearborn. Mm -hmm. Wow. Wow. That's so important to hear. Yeah. Um, so you talk about the first few months. Um, and so obviously, and I think this just goes for any college student. I was an educator, so I know that the, the toughest time is your freshman year because you literally just went from raising your hand to go use the bathroom right. to like picking your own schedule and deciding if you even want to go to class. Right. right. No one's no one's calling you if you're not. Yeah. Um, so aside from just the academic rigor, like the barrier that you yeah. probably had to deal with getting over that learning curve to like the culture shock of right. leaving a community like ours to going out of state, which people don't do. So you didn't have like a like yeah. I had a frame, you know, I, I was going to Ann Arbor with other out of from Dearborn right. so we were all kind of like dumb and dumber figuring it out you know <laughs> together which was nice but you didn't have something like that so there's that and then there's just like obviously being you know all of your identities put together 
Um, so that first year, I can imagine, was probably your hardest, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, even down to when, when my whole family dropped me off at Harvard. So, you know, we packed this big truck and we drove to Boston. It took like 12 hours. And, you know, th that morning we were unpacking, like we're all just kind of all hands on mm -hmm. deck, hanging up my clothes, building the couch, all of that. And I had two roommates at the time that were randomly assigned. And, you know, at that point, my dad's like, all right, you know, we should get going. We have another 12 hour drive. And we were about to walk out the room. And all of a sudden, it just, it just hit me that like they're leaving me like they're going to leave their, their the baby of the Aww. family and just go back to Dearborn without me. And I think it was something that hit me that I wasn't expecting it to. And so um, I had this like huge urge, urge to just cry. And so, but I was, I was literally yelling at myself. I was like, do not cry because if Aww. you cry, mama's going to start crying and then they'll, everyone's going to start crying. And they literally, we, I step out, like literally my foot steps out the door and I just lose Aww. it. I just start bawling my eyes out and my mom turns around and sees me and then she starts bawling and then my sister <laughs> Fada starts bawling and we're literally like holding all, like sitting in a circle, holding each other, crying. And my roommates are probably like, what is going on here? Um, I love and it. then my, my dad, actually, this was, I think probably the second time did like the most quintessential Arab dad thing. So he was like about to cry and like, you know, he like sniffs and like takes out like a lot of cash and just starts giving me money of like you're gonna need this, oh my God, this is and, so so <laughs> and so in his like effort to not cry he just did like the only way to like you know oh. show affection or love is to just like hand need me money, money, Bubba. Right? Need money. <laughs> and so you know he like you know hands me the money like gives me like a little hug and like they're on their way um <laughs> and like literally in those weeks like I think I think what also hit me was because in our reality you don't go out of state yeah. and you don't leave your family it was so much harder for me to adjust to that life because everyone around me you know they had, it had been something they're preparing for literally their whole life while mine was just simply wasn't that and so it was adjusting to the rigor but also to just really missing my family mm. and my community and wanting to be in Dearborn all the time and so I think you know uh, other than just like the rigor of of being you know challenged in the way that Harvard challenged me it was just again adjusting to the social life mm. of being who I was and leaving the community and having no one there with me of like, yeah. no matter how homesick I get, I couldn't just drive home. Wow. You know, I had to stick it out until that next break. And so really, yeah, the, the first year was so difficult, but with that came so much growth. And I, I, even till now, I encourage everyone to leave for their college years or really for any amount of years, because the amount of growth and perception and really figuring out who you are, outside of the walls of the community I think is so so important mm. um yeah so yeah. this is kind of a more humorous because I, I completely agree with that but sometimes my favorite thing to do is replay those like the story that you told about like when everyone is crying and you know you're leaving like through like an outsider's lens who doesn't understand our community because right. again like one of the things you look you, you get a lens when you leave Dearborn you get a lens of like how funny and crazy some of the stuff we do <laughs> and it makes you love us even more because you don't realize how special we are but I'm literally just pretending I'm one of your were, were your roommates white yeah okay like you're one of your white roommates and literally seeing these this like Muslim family come in like one girl starts crying then they all start crying okay so like okay we can kind of understand that like they're crying you know they're sad who knows what they think and then the dad just starts pulling out singles <laughs> And like literally pulling out a lot of literally cash, I would be so confused. Right, like, it's like, do you I not have a like, debit card? What is like, happening? Like, why is everyone crying? Do they just pay each other when they cry? Like, what are they? What are these people doing? Oh my I God. love replaying yeah. those moments through like an outsider's yeah. lens. Yeah, and you know, it's so interesting. Even my first year, I would get this comment so much on like where are you from? You have an accent. Oh and it didn't God. hit me that I had a Dearborn, Dearborn accent. accent. And like, it just, it wasn't something I, I, after like the 10th time I got it, I was like, wait, I think like I have an accent. Right. So What's, what, what did they I, used to say? Did people I, used to guess They would places? just ask like, oh, like, where are you from? Like, you have an accent. And I was like, Dearborn. So, I've <laughs> and, learned and it's to say real. that. It is. So it's I'm, a Dearborn accent. It it's is. like this weird mix between a Midwestern yes. and an Arab like boater fobby accent. I don't know what it is. I feel like there's more ingredients to that. Yeah, like, people yeah. Are, like are you from New York? And only the, the only the non New York people or people who probably don't really know what a New York accent sounds like yeah. would say that. But they're trying to place it. And so once I got to the point where I realized it's a Dearborn accent, I'll just be yeah. like, Nah, man, I'm from Dearborn. Just come right. over. Like, every, we all talk like you. Like you'll understand. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and like I saw my I felt myself losing it a little over the years. And like being back the last three years, I feel like I've gained a little bit of it back. And I, love I it. kind of like it. I, I like, like that it I have it a little. So we're going to take it full circle. So Mediam mm -hmm. goes through 
Um, you know, first year was difficult, obviously being like the poster child. Like she really was the poster child. Cause I remember like, didn't we like, didn't you show me something? So Mariam and I got close over the years. You showed me something that I posted on your wall when you got in, even when we yeah, weren't even close. And it was yeah. just this long emotional, like, you're so amazing. Yeah. You're putting our city on the map. Yeah. And like, we still all feel that way about you. And, you know, obviously <laughs> hearing that you're talking to the women who are, who are going there, like all of that, you planted that seed. And so like, obviously we're so proud of you. Um, I think my proudest moment, and I remember my family just circulated it so quickly through the group chat, was when you were the commencement speaker. So Maryam was the commencement speaker for her Harvard graduation, a Arab Muslim woman from East Dearborn, from Fortson, literally in front of like, just like, you know, the elite, you yeah. know, getting up and speaking your truth. Your speech was amazing. I still remember it. Um, talk about that process. Don't skip a beat. Talk about like what made you even, was it that same moment of like, who do I think I am? And like, just go through that. Yeah. I mean, I think at that point I, I've definitely in a very healthy way shed a lot of the self doubt that I had. Um, and so when the time came where, you know, they said they sent out the big email of, you know, we're accepting Harvard speech, like the speeches to become the, the commencement speaker. And at the time I remember thinking, going back to, when I got accepted, I felt like there was no other moment that topped that elated pride mm -hmm. for my family and then even w within my community. And I remember thinking if I got this speech and I was up there speaking in front of 15,000 people as a visibly Muslim woman, mm -hmm. I think that would be that would be a moment where I could possibly top the pride that my parents yeah. felt. And so I just remember saying, I'm going to do it. I'm definitely going to apply. And so I spent a lot of time working on the speech and I didn't want it to have anything to do with, you know, my identity. I just wanted to be like any other speaker speaking about something that really meant a lot to me in, in my years. And so, um, when the time came, yeah, I applied, I went through like the rehearsal rounds and then, you know, I got chosen as a speaker. And, you know, when I, when I told my parents that I was going to be speaking, I just remember calling them of like, I got the speech, like I'm going to be the speaker. And they were just really stunned. Mm -hmm. And what's so crazy is so, you know, fast forward to the day, you know, my graduation yeah. day and, and the day of the speech that the night before I had practiced my speech full, like I had, me it was an eight minute speech. I memorized it down to like the, the dot and I had practiced the entire thing, um, to my friend. And I was like, all right, you know, I'm going to go to sleep. I have a big day tomorrow. And my family was flying in that morning to hear me speak that morning. And I wake up for some reason at 4 a.m. And my voice was completely gone. Like when I say gone, it wasn't like it was raspy. Like I literally could not create noise wow. from, you know, like it was just gone. So I'm texting my mom at like four in the morning. I'm like, my voice is gone. I can't give the speech. And at that point I had just kind of this weird, like calm washed over me of like, you know, I just, I wasn't meant to give the speech. Wow. Like it's fine. And of course the committee who picked me was not having it. They're like, you're on the program. Like you are giving the speech. And I was like, no, you guys don't understand. I physically cannot speak. And so, you know, I go backstage and I'm like practicing the speech out loud. And I, I would get two sentences in and my voice would completely give out. And so I was freaking out and, you know, I don't really get nervous publicly speaking, but what made me nervous was the thought of like my voice giving out in front of like 15,000 people. And so I turned to the guy next to me and I was like, you're going to have to finish my speech when I, when I can't like get through it. Wow. He's like, no, listen, you're going to be fine. The adrenaline's going to kick in. Um, you know, they, they introduced me and I made sure when they introduced me, they kind of, they asked you of like what they want you to deliver. And I made sure to say that I was born and raised in Dearborn, mm -hmm. Michigan. And I wanted that kind of to be in the introduction on the, the national stage. Um, and so by nothing but the grace of God, I got through the entire eight minute speech. My voice didn't crack, but what I remember is, um, what, halfway through the speech I like busted out laughing and it was literally <laughs> because I look out into the audience my fair my parents are front and center and my mom is just like bawling Whoa. like tears going down her eyes and my dad is just sitting there like praying that like I don't lose my voice and so just like the visual of oh like my, my mom bawling and my dad's next to her like praying I look out into them and I just bust out laughing in the middle of my your speech. roommates are probably like look at them they're weird again like everybody <laughs> cries and people just do weird <laughs> and 
it's crazy. It's like my dad, my dad and brother are wearing like suits, and everyone's like wearing like t-shirts, and they're like, "Are we overdressed?" But my dad's like, "No, nah, like my daughter is giving right. me a Harvard speech. Like I'm not showing up anything yeah. less than like a suit." I love and so that. it was just kind of this full circle moment of you know my parents dropped me, my entire family dropped me off, sent me to Harvard. You know, four years go by, I turn into you know the the woman that I that I became, and mm. then you know that following day we were in in that dorm packing up all my stuff to leave and so it was just really symbolic and like beautiful to me of like you know they they sent me there and now like they came and they took me back home to Mm. Dearborn and so I love it it really was just such a beautiful and like happy moment and I think that was the one moment that might have topped like like the acceptance acceptance. yeah so let's talk briefly about your homecoming so I was I was lucky enough to be invited to your graduation celebration at the Arab American Museum it was a great we showed this the speech if you want to look up her speech it's on YouTube um, you should look it up it's amazing um, but I felt the energy in that room everybody was just so proud and like talk about how you felt like how did you feel during that first like homecoming moment and how have you felt since yeah. being back um, and I guess like look a little bit towards the future a little bit too. What do you see yourself doing now that you've gotten both experiences? Yeah. So, you know, as w- when I made the decision to come back, it was fully like, you know, I spent my four years away. I traveled. I saw the world. Like mm. now it's time to come back home. And so even when the time came to apply to grad schools, I actually only applied to University of Michigan for that reason, mm. to be close to home again. Um, and so I, I definitely felt again like that that pride of being back in my city and just you know having so many people congratulate me and, and be so proud of me. But you know I'd be lying if I said that even the transition back was incredibly difficult. And I think part of it was kind of being pigeonholed or like you know I just remember coming back and I'd done all these amazing things mm-hmm. and I traveled and I had so many like amazing stories that you know made me who I am. But all of a sudden, a lot of the conversations would end up being so like, when are you getting married? Like, do you have someone? And it just kind of seemed like, so with all my accomplishments, like that's kind of, is this how we reduce Mm. like the women in the community of like, you know, your worth comes with whether you have someone or, so I I was feeling a little bit of that pressure. I just all of a sudden started thinking like, should I be finding someone? (laughs) Like, should I be looking for a Mm. husband? And like, it, it was kind of this, this weird year transition back. And, you know, at the time, it's a little, you know, controversial, I guess, to say, but I, I would always say this of, like, I feel like my dreams are dying. Mm, and, and I mm. was like, you know, is it, I, I would say the sentence, which now I don't really believe, but, like, you know, Dearborn's a place where your dreams die. And, and I guess the reason I was feeling that was, you know, I had all these amazing goals and aspirations at, when I was at Harvard. And I came back, and I just felt like they were kind of being stunted, mm. and people were really only concerned about certain aspects of my life. And... um so I, I, I definitely felt that pressure and I think it made the adjustment back a little difficult. Mm. But, you know, in the three years that I've been back and, and working on my master's and, and now that I'm graduating, you know, I, I am leaving again. So I'll be going to D.C., which I'm super excited about to fulfill that lifelong dream of mine. But I'm doing it now in a way where I'm taking Dearborn with me. Yeah. You know, I always yeah. say that, like within our community we we're able to accumulate wealth really well for example you know we have amazing successful small businesses but i think where we lack is being in the halls of power Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. i think what i my ideal situation would be to get as many whether it's arab americans or just people from dearborn in positions where they're pursuing careers and lifelong goals where they're able to enact real change, like on the national level, Mm. you know? And so I think for me, I'm always preaching, it goes beyond being a doctor or a pharmacist or an engineer. You know, we need to get into where it matters. We need to be in the halls of power so that at a national scale, scale, our policies and everything is reflecting our Mm. needs just as much because we're just as American as, you know, and it goes without saying, of course, but, um, so now that I have that dream and I'm going out into DC, it's not, you know, in spite of, or in lieu of Dearborn, it's actually to take Dearborn with me and like to, um, and so I think being back was, was difficult, but I think in a really great way where it really grounded me in the impact that I want to have on the world. Mm -hmm. And, you know, again, it just reminds you your roots and where you came from. And so I think now I don't necessarily believe Dearborn is is a place where dreams go to die. I think, in fact, it can 
be the foundation of a lot of those dreams. Wow. I just got goosebumps like three <laughs> times, literally three times, like I don't, pick, envisioning you like taking a part of this foundation with you. And, and I really believe in what you're saying. I really think that we need to have a seat at the table. Um, yeah. Really quickly, before we kind of close off this amazing conversation, what would you say to the, the young, like the young men and women who are listening, who are pursuing higher education and um, perhaps having complicated relationships with their community right yeah. now? Yeah, I mean, my number one advice through and through is always just pursue what you love. And I know it sounds so cliche and kind of not really grounded in any like tangible steps, but you know, don't let anyone, the community pigeonhole you into, mm. you know, only becoming a doctor or X, you know, pursue what you love and think about the level of impact you want to have in the world and never think that those dreams are far fetched mm. because th the biggest disservice would be to not go for it, mm. to not apply. Because when you do that, you reject yourself. I always say, always apply, always shoot for the stars, apply for that job. You think you're, you're, you're not going to get, because if you don't, then you're rejecting Absolutely. yourself. And so I, that's really been my biggest advice. Absolutely. I love through. that. Okay. I love yeah. that. Thank you. <laughs> and last question. What makes you most proud to be a Dearborn girl? You know, what makes me most proud to be a Dearborn girl is kind of everything we've just been talking about. I love that we have our own accent. We have our own language, our own vocabulary. Yes, the, the, <laughs> even, you know, just the, the community itself. I think something I've been so proud of and anywhere I go, I say I'm from Dearborn is that no matter what, where I go, how long I leave, Dear One will always be here to welcome mm -hmm. me back. And I think it's so, one of the most comforting things in the world. And so I, I love it. I love being a Dearborn girl and yes. I love Dearborn. <laughs> I love that. Thank you so much, Marianne. Thank we you. love you. Thank you for coming on the show. Thank you. This was amazing. Thank you.